Praise God. If you will, let's turn to James, the second chapter. That's all right. I got. I know somebody that can whip them in shape. Good to visit, isn't it? Fellowship. Praise the Lord. James, the second chapter. Let's start with the first verse. You know, when, when you start, when you open up the book of James, you're dealing with faith. And here, in the second chapter, he's also dealing with faith. You know, the first one is faith under trial. You know, when our, when our faith is tested. And now... You know, the Lord is, is looking at our motives, you know, and the intent of our heart. You know, we don't have a whole lot of, of what I would call poverty, true poverty in our nation. I mean, I, I, I talk to people and have dealt with, with different situations in my life, traveling overseas and um, I mean, it's amazing uh, the extreme poverty that some people face. I know John sees it a lot. Him, he and I were talking about that last night. Uh, you know, we what we call poor is not poor. You know, uh, people don't have vehicles. You know, they don't have bicycles. They walk. You know where they want to go, um, and and it's an oppressive thing. You know, poverty is not a blessing. It's not. It doesn't come from God. But you know, Jesus said, "The poor you have with you always." He did. He said, "The poor you're going to always have the poor. You're not going to always have me, but you're going to always have the poor. There's always going to be people in that position, that situation, and that circumstance." You know, because nothing is guaranteed. I mean, you're, you're, there's one thing that, you know, there's one uh, stable fact that's changed. Things are always changing, you know. And, you know, you know not what a day may bring. That's what the scripture says. You, you don't know what a day is going to bring. And, you know, our estimation of, of people, you know, has a lot to do with your perspective. And your perspective has a lot to do with your faith. And your faith... You know, it is guided and, and, and built upon the Word of God. That's where your faith comes from. So we've got to see what how God sees things is the way faith sees things. And that's the way we should see things. You know, we have to train ourselves, you know, not to think like the world thinks. The Scripture clearly teaches do not be pressed into the world's mold or its way of thinking. Because the way of the world is wrong. It's twisted and it's perverted. And it deals only with what you can see and feel. What you can smell and touch and taste. You know, but God looks beyond that. He looks beyond the veil of flesh. You know, and that's the way we should see things too. We should see people in a different perspective than what the world sees. Because the world is going to, they're going to weigh you. Many times by what you wear what you drive, you know, uh, how much money you make, what kind of house you live in. You know, they're going to they're gonna, uh, measure your success in life and, and, and the type of person that you are by the things that you possess and, and by your status. But it tells us right here in the second chapter, it says, My brethren, starting with the first verse, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now this word respect here, it means that, that you're admiring somebody because of their abilities or because of their uh, success, you know, or, or because of their talent. You know, you're, you, you, you're admiring this person. You have respect of persons because of maybe success this person has had in their life, their right choices. Maybe the gifts that God has given them, you know, and you have, a, a, you admire this person, 
But you know, I see many, many people that are very successful and very rich. And you know, they're not admirable. You know, they may have accumulated goods, you know, uh, they may have uh, acquired great wealth or, or even, even fame, but they're, I don't admire them, admire them at all. You know, many things that, that the world projects as, as something that's desirable and to be had, you know, the scripture clearly teaches that us, you know, Jesus, he said in the gospels, he said, what, what men play, place great value on is an abomination to God. You know, it goes, it goes crossways to culture, you know, and what we're taught. That, you know, we, and we'll read on down a little bit further, but, you know, we, we've got to be careful not to, to measure people and see people according to what the world calls success. You know, you're not successful, you know, if, if, if you don't have a church with thousands. Well, you know what? The, the, the mega churches have not produced the type of Christianity that we see in the scriptures. You know, it's almost like a, it's another status symbol that you belong to a mega church or I belong to this church. Well, I went to a mega church in Tulsa when I was up there. And look, I got, I got my socks blessed off in that church. Brother Bob Yandian was teaching the gospel of grace according to the scriptures 30 something years ago. And I used, to, <laughs> I used to wonder why I would go there and just get so blessed. I mean, I would just, the presence of God would come and I would just weep and weep and weep and worship. I couldn't keep my hands down. And I would leave there and I, I would say, what is it about this church? You know, I'm sitting right in the middle of, a, of a, a church that was teaching grace and I didn't get it. You know what I'm saying? But yet there was something missing going to that church because there was not a closeness. There was not a belonging. There was not somebody you could go talk to. Oh, you could go up front and pray. But once you got through praying, you know, you went home. You know, and if you if you didn't have a personal life of study and discipline, you know, you could you could be lost by the wayside. So many of the things that, that we see today are not according to biblical patterns. It's not. You know, in the early church, they went from house to house. They had street ministry, of course, but, you know, they had went from house to house. They had a personal relationship, you know, pastor and teacher, you know, not only the ones that laid the foundation in the church, but the ones that stayed behind and had a personal touch with the people. You know, and a lot of times people think if you don't go to, you know, I don't know, what do they call it? Big, not mega church, but, but uh, uh, first church. That's what it is, first church. You know, biggest church in town, you know, with the most people on the roll. And, and they have all the programs going, you know, and, and they've got it. You know, but a lot of times programs, they're just a, a poor substitute for the reality that God has in the scripture. They try to do things by program. They try, to, they try to organize everything. They don't pray. You know, they just have to you know, you just meet with this group and you do things a certain way, A, B, C, D. They have certain principles they go by. And nobody's ever really transformed or changed or touched. Because, you know, it's, it's the world's way of looking at things. It's, it's almost like a business, you know. And many times people get off track, especially people that are ministers, they're head of the ministry, because they're more about numbers. They're more about success. They're more about more, more money, more numbers, more books, more, you know, and if they're not doing that, then, you know, they want to make some changes and they will actually start compromising their message. They'll start being seeker friendly, you know, and, and the thing about it, if you're going to obey God, it may cost you something. It may cost you numbers. Right. It may cost you members. I was telling John the other day, I said, you know, I was, I was listening to Brother Bill Johnson at Bethel Church, and he said that he went to a meeting, and, and, and while he was there, he, he was so hungry for God, and he said he went back to his home church where he was pastor, and he said, look, look, folks, we're not, we're not going uh, to make Jesus a part of our program. We're not going to add him to what we're doing here. 
We're, look, I got touched, and he said, we're going to make everything that we do about him. And he said, a thousand people left the church. I remember when Jesus preached a sermon one time, and everybody left but the twelve. And I'm sure if Judas wasn't in charge of the purse, he'd have left too. <laughs> Amen. You know, but we, we, we look at things from the natural. We, we, we look at people that are, maybe they're, they're not successful. Maybe they're, they, they don't have a, a, a ride or a car, a nice car. You know, maybe they're down. You know, and they come. And, 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 and maybe God sends them to us. How, how are we going to treat them? How are we going to look at that person? How are we going to look at the drug addict or, or the alcoholic? How are we going to look at somebody that maybe went through a divorce and, and was emotionally devastated and, and just gave up and quit work? They've got a lot of people that are living on the streets, not here in Natchitoches so much, but like if I go to Pensacola or or someplace like that to visit. There are people that are living under bridges. There are people that are damaged goods, that are that are veterans, that have uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, or, or and, and, and emotionally uh, damaged, and and they're poor. And and people, if we're not careful, then we'll categorize those people. You know, we'll 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 put a stamp on them. Oh, they're there for you know it's. It's their fault. And there are some people that they are there for their fault. They are there because of bad choices. You know, they are there because of addictions. But that doesn't mean that that's where the Lord wants to leave them. Amen. You know? And, we, you know, we're not the Savior of the world. We, we can't save everybody, but He's the Savior. That's right. And He'll send you or He'll send them to you at times. You know, I never forget... Uh, there was a man that walked in here, I guess it was four or five years ago now. Uh, he came to Sister Francis and uh, he, he asked her for help. Well, uh, Sister Francis said, would you bring him over to the, to the motel? I said, I'll be glad to. You know, <clears throat> we loaded him up and she uh, gave me the money to buy him a motel room for the night. And, uh, you know, we need to regard people. Uh, we need to treat people with respect because these people are created in the image and likeness of God. You know, they're, they're his creation. And we need to treat them with respect. Yes, and we need to honor them because the Lord is watching you. Yes. He's watching your attitude. He's watching your motive of what you're doing. And I walked in that motel uh, and, you know, we didn't realize that... Uh, you know, there are other charges that, that, that you have to pay, like these tourist taxes. They're like 10%. You know, so when you buy somebody a motel room, you've got to understand that just the fee for the night, when you call, you know, that might not be all there is to it. You know what I'm saying? They might still be outside. So, you know, had to take care of some more charges. And then looked at him and said, you know, because I like to eat. How many of you people like to eat here? Looking around, some of you do a lot, but and I do too. I love good food. But I asked him, I said, you know, uh, do you have anything to eat? And he's like, no. So you know, I ordered him a pizza and uh, got him situated. You know, bought him something to drink other than water. You know, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just giving you an example. You know, and I noticed that his tennis shoes were were uh, not in good shape. And and I, after I left him, I thought, you know, I got a pair of shoes at the, or maybe the next day I thought about it. I had a pair of shoes that I could have given him. You know, because he was on his way back home. He wanted to go to his family. I don't know exactly what, it doesn't matter what happened, how he got in that shape. <clears throat> but the Lord would expect you to meet somebody's need. Now, there are some people that are bums. Okay, there are some people that know how to work the system and try to work the church. So you have to be careful, you know. But I would rather uh, be on the side of being careful to minister to the poor than restraining myself and not helping when somebody really needs help. So you have to be led by the Spirit, too. But, you know, we, we, we have to make sure that we don't categorize people, you know. 
when people are down, when people need a helping hand. You know, sometimes people suffer tragedy. Sometimes their house burns down. Sometimes they lose their job. You know, it, it, there's all kinds of situations that take place that would, would put a person in that position to where they're in need. You know, so we need to be careful not to be critical or judgmental in these areas when God sends somebody to us. Let's read on down. Verse 2, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the, the good clothing, the beautiful clothes, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? See, the Lord says this is evil. To treat people differently according to their financial status. And believe you me, people with money want to be treated differently. Oh, yes. They want to be treated special. I've had people come in my place of business and, and, and say, I hope... I hope this place goes out of business. I, I hope I'm going to do everything I can to cut your throat. You know, I'll never be back in here again because they weren't treated uh, with favor, special favor because they were rich. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be good to all your customers because you should. But I would never let anybody move ahead in line because, you know, they were rich or affluent and, and because somebody that was poor, you know, uh, and make them wait. It's just, it's not right. God's not pleased with that. Right. You know, it reveals that you have evil thoughts. You know, and it's a pride thing. It all goes back to pride. You know, many times a person that, that, that's rich, you know, the person may be thinking, you know, maybe I can get a favor from this person. You know, maybe they can do something for me, work things in my favor. You know, maybe I can become their friend. You know, and they can, they can do things for me. Give me an inside shoe. You know, this poor guy, he can't do anything for me. You know, I'm, I'm probably going to have to end up taking care of him or doing something for him. So we treat him, you know, with less value. And in the eyes of God, all men have the same value. They're all created in the image and likeness of God. And so we, we need to be careful not to. Not to treat other pe people in different, that we don't categorize them. You know, when people have respect, you know, for people with money and success in the world's eyes. And we don't need to do that. It says, you become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them? That loved him. Now we have to understand that God loves everybody. He loves the rich. He loves the poor. As a matter of fact, there are people that are that are called of God to minister to rich people. There are people, rich people need ministry too. And there are people that are specifically called to minister to people that have money and that are successful because God loves them. And look, there is a snare and there is a danger in being rich. Because riches bring the possibility, you know, of doing things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do if you were poor. You know, I heard, I heard one minister say one time, he said, there's not much danger of adultery with a poor man. You know what I'm saying? Because he's struggling to take care of his family. You know what I'm saying? He's struggling to pay his bills. He had not got a chance to have a mistress on the side. But when you start, when you start having power and money, then you get into a lot of trouble. There's a lot of snares. The Bible said drowns men in perdition and destruction. So, you know, many times people that are poor, you know, they have their trust in God. They have to trust God. They, they remember the Lord because they need him. Because they're living many times from paycheck to paycheck, day to day, they're putting their trust in him. So in a lot of ways, it's not as dangerous to be in need, or what we would call, the world would call poor, and be trusting in God. You know, the Bible talks about the widow, trusting in God. Got to trust God for your meal. 
I've been there a few times. I mean, I could have got on the phone and called somebody and said, look, I have an emergency, you know, but I was wanting to trust God. I mean, down to the place where we didn't have anything to eat, you know, and God came through supernaturally, came through, supplied food, you know, canned goods. And it, it, I'm telling you what, when you're happy about a can of fruit cocktail, you're hungry, man. You're ready when you've been eating potatoes and you try to fix potatoes in all kinds of different ways. You know, but you know, it didn't hurt me. It didn't hurt me at all. I learned how to trust God. I learned how to put my faith in God, you know? And so we, we don't need to, we don't need to judge people because they're in need. Because God will actually, he will actually position you at, at times in your life to where you're in need, to where you need him. You have to trust him. The children of Israel, when they were going through the desert and it was supposed to be a 10 day journey, you know, to the Jordan River. They ended up staying out there for 40 years. He took care of them. He took care of them, supplied their needs every day, bread and water. He took care of them. But, you know, and, and we may be in that position sometime on a temporary basis. But God doesn't expect us to stay there. You know, God doesn't want to keep people poor. God wants to bless people. But, you know, when, when God begins to bless us, I, I remember when I was uh, going to Ramah, uh, I started off with a job. It was, it was a terrible job, but I stayed there. And, uh, you know, he supernaturally supplied some needs for me, and uh, I just kept believing God. And we'd pay our little bitty tithes, you know, and then a job opening came up. And it was a great, it was a great job. I loved working there. Had a great boss. He was a backslidden Christian, but he had respect into the ministry. He had respect for God. And he eventually he came back to the Lord for serving God when he passed away. But uh, you know, I remember that that opportunity came and I served faithfully. You know, I worked hard. Uh, I, I was never late. And you know what? Even during that time, I only had one vehicle. And, had, had, and, and Maureen worked, that was my wife. Maureen worked across town. She worked with a cleaning service. And you know what? Sometimes our uh, schedules didn't jive. And I was about two miles away from my workplace. Do you know what I would do some days? I'd put my shoes on. I'd put my little outfit on. And I would walk to work. Do you know there are some people that would refuse to walk to work? Oh, no, man, I'm not walking to work. I'll be able to call in. I can't come in today, man. No, no. I was willing to walk to work, you know, so I could be faithful. I wanted to be a good example. You know, I wanted to be a good employee, you know, at that place. And God promoted me. I, I, I'll never forget, you know, just, just listening to the voice of God. Uh, uh, somebody came and offered me a job at another store. And it really upset my, uh, my market manager. He didn't want to lose me. That's a testimony right there. Your boss don't want to lose you. And uh, so I accepted this job. And uh, I went over, and it wasn't but a stone's throw away from where I was working. And uh, the owner of the other store came over, and he was complaining about all his good employees, you know, working over at this other store. Well, they paid more, you know. But about two weeks in, I started hating this job. Man, I hate this job. Did I make a mistake? Did I miss you, Lord? Did I, did I not obey your voice? You know, and, and while I was walking uh, on lunch break, uh, the Lord said, go, go back over there and uh, talk to Tom. That was his name, Tom, Tom Ford. And uh, I walked in. He said, man, I am glad to see you. I, he said, you want your job back? I said, I'd like to come back, Tom. And uh, he said, well, let me go talk to the store manager. What kind of money do you want? I told him what kind of money I want. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a dollar less than what you're, you're making over there, but you can come back over here and work. I said, I'll take it. So I got a, at that time, $2.50 an hour was a lot, you know, back in 80, 87. So I got a, a raise. I left. They missed me. I came back, and I would have never got a raise without leaving. So I, I followed the leadership of the Lord and got a promotion, and uh, I was a part-time worker. 
I was considered part-time because I was a student. So they didn't want to pay students. But they needed a night, an evening manager so bad. You know, but that just shows you that if you'll be faithful and you do what you have to do, that God will promote you if you'll give him a chance. Sometimes it takes a little time for God to work things out, but he will. And it's the same way with people in poverty. If people will listen to the Lord, if they'll obey him, then he will lift them. The Bible talks about lifting the poor out of the dunghill and setting them among princes. So God's about lifting people up. You know, there's always going to be people that needs to be lifted up out of poverty. You know, many times their mind, their mindset, their think, their way of thinking, you know, is wrong. I get tickled at people. I, I see them in the store a lot of times, and, and I see them buying lottery tickets or, or, or scratch-off. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope that's not your retirement plan because I think you're going to be you're going to, But a lot of times people just need a financial education. A lot of times people just need to learn how to budget their money. A lot of times people just need to learn how to value money and not value spending money. You know what I'm saying? And, and to have control. You know, and the Lord will teach people. The Bible talks about the rich and the poor meeting together and the Lord in, enlightening the eyes of them both. The rich need their eyes enlightened too. Because what they have comes from God. It's a gift from God. And God wants us to have respect unto the poor. He doesn't want us to disrespect them. I, I was a, I had a couple that used to come to the plant, and I would always try to help them. And God knows they weren't perfect, but I would always treat them with respect. And they would probably be considered the lowest of the low in, in our society. But I always treated them with respect. I always tried to help them any way I could. And uh, I was in the store one day in Brookshire's, and uh, the, the lady that I used to help all the time, uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't have all of her, her, of her teeth. You know, and if you're missing your teeth, that's okay. I'm missing some too. And, uh, but she, you know, her hair was all wiry looking, and she was dressed in, in some terrible shorts and, and, and a dirty shirt. And I came walking in there and I was doing some shopping. And this, this gal, she started running about where John's at there. She ran and jumped up into my arms. And you know, a lot of people would have been embarrassed. You know, and she didn't mean anything wrong by it. She was just showing that she appreciated me and she loved me. But she didn't even know how to act in public. You know, there's a lot of people that don't know how to act. They're not, they're not educated. They're not trained. You know, they don't know how to act. And, and you know, I didn't make a scene. And, you know, I just loved her and, and just, you know, talked to her. A lot of people wouldn't even want to talk to the lady. They wouldn't want to be seen with her, you know. But, you know, it all has to do with valuing that person, you know. And I, I see her now, and she's doing much better, you know. She, her life has improved. You know, she's, she's more blessed now than she's ever been in her life. So the Lord wants to lift people up. Let's read on now. In uh, verse number six, it says, But you have despised the poor, counted them as worth little, of little worth, you know, because they don't have anything or possessions. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? Now, this is not all rich people, but I would say the majority of the world, people in the world like this, you know, fit into this category. It said, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now I'm going to show you what category this puts you in. Okay? And he's going to use some extremes here, okay? He says, but uh, verse number 10, for whoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that saith do not commit adultery 
said also, do not kill. Now, if thou condemn, but if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art still a transgressor of the law. See, so he's placing this respect of persons in the same category because he just got set through saying, you sin. In the eyes of God, you know, we, we look at things differently, but God looks at the heart. Because many times, you know, the spiritual sins of the heart <clears throat> that people can't see are more important to God. I'm not saying all things aren't wrong, but God looks at the heart and the spiritual things and the things that are outside of love, you know, just as seriously as he does sins of the flesh. So we, you know, we look at things from the natural, but God looks at your heart. And how you judge people, how you categorize people, how you have respect unto somebody <coughs> because they're in a, <coughs> a different financial area in their life. And, you know, right here it says, verse number 11, I mean, verse number 12, so speak ye and so do you as those who shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices or glories against judgment. Look, we need to be very careful to be compassionate and to be merciful to people. You know, I, I, uh, I, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, I was in a church service one time, and they were taking up an offering. This has been 15 years ago. And they were taking up an offering for orphanage. And uh, I, I just felt compelled to give. You know, the Bible talks about ministering to the widows, to the orphans, to the stranger. And so I wrote a check out uh, for $500 to help out with the orphanage. And uh, a minister came up to me after the service and told me, he said, Roger, you're the only one that gave anything. To minister to the orphans. And he said, I want you to know God's going to bless you. You know, when you start when you start ministering to people that are truly poor, the people that are really down and out, to the stranger, you know, it, it touches the heart of God. Uh, I, over and over again in the Old Testament, in the law, God told you, you be careful how you treat the stranger. You, you, you make sure that you don't abuse him or mistreat him or, or, or don't, you know, don't mistreat the orphans, don't mistreat the widows, don't defraud them, you know? And when I, when I wrote that check, uh, I, 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 you know, the minister told me, he said, you, you know, God's going to bless you. Well, I knew God was going to bless me because I gave. So I never was really expecting anything super big, you know? I was expecting God to prosper my business, you know, take care of my family. I was believing all that. And, uh, but I had a little bank account with a hundred dollars in it. And I, I I'd had that bank account open for 10 years and I never put anything in it, never took anything out of it. But I just happened to be going by there one day. I said, you know, I'm gonna go get that money out of there. I need that hundred dollars. So I stopped by and picked up that hundred dollars. Well, when I closed my account out there, it was associated with a company I used to work for. And so when I closed my account out, uh, they notified the company, which notified the investment firm where I had put some retirement money while I was working at that company. And just to be honest with you, I forgot all about it. I had forgot all about it. How many of you ever forget about money you've got? I don't see no hands. I forgot about that money. It was probably four or five thousand dollars or something like that I left there. You know, I didn't really think about it. I hadn't given it a thought. I was too busy. I had a house full of kids. And you know, I had my own congregation at home. You know, I was a head chef. And, 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 you know, so I had plenty to do. But anyway, so when I closed this account out, they contacted the company. The company contacted the, the investment firm, which is Vanguard. And uh, I, I got a notice in the mail. Never got a notice from them before. Never got a statement from them before. Opened up that statement. And it was almost $30,000 in that investment. I was like, praise God. You know, what a blessing. See, when you obey God, he'll lift you up. 
You know what I'm saying? And that's what we need to teach people. And people need to be operating in the principles of God. You know, we need to teach people. You know, the Lord's about teaching people and lifting them up and teaching them how to prosper, teaching them how to make wise. So the most important thing that you could ever receive from God would be wisdom, insight, insight, foresight, oversight. You know, God wants to teach his people how to operate in wisdom and not make foolish choices. You know, I hate credit cards. How many of you hate credit cards? How many of you hate that interest that charge? I like them with their paid off. Yeah, I just paid mine off the other day. It felt good. I didn't order, I didn't owe them $160. So boy, you know, I was glad to get that, you know, get them off my back. But there are a lot of people that are bound by many foolish things. You know, the Bible talks about the borrower servant to the lender, doesn't it? And, and we don't need to be uh, making foolish choices. You know, if you can cook a pot of beans at home, and some cornbread instead of stopping by and spending fifty dollars for hamburgers on the way home that's another point of wisdom i've learned that it's a whole lot cheaper to cook at home and that some people can't do it i know some people are super super busy but man it doesn't take much to put some beans in a crock pot you know or pork rolls they had them on sale at 90 for 97 cents last week at brookshire's you know and a lot of people are just making because of convenience and because uh, we're spoiled making wrong choices and keeping themselves in debt, they have no money in the savings account. No emergency money. If something goes wrong, they're just, they're in bad, they're just out of luck. But God don't want you to be like that. That's why he talks about your barns. That's what they make barns for, to stick hay in a barn so you'll have it in the wintertime. You know, I get amazed at people. I had somebody call me the other day. I'm not going to say who it was. Somebody in my family. And they're like, oh, man, we need $200. I mean, I'm thinking, I, you make 10 times as much money as I do. And you need $200. And you're going to call me. I mean, I, I have to get my quarters that I've rolled up and send you the money. I don't mind doing it to help you. But there's no reason. You ought to be sending me money. You know what I'm saying? But it has to do with foolish, not, not valuing money you know, Jesus, he said that, and I quote this quite a bit. He said, if you are unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, in money, if you can't be trusted with money, who shall entrust to you the true riches? That's a litmus test, man. You know, I watch that. You know, if I was to be interested in a, a, a sweetheart, first thing I want to know is how much money you've got in your savings account. And can you balance a checkbook? And do you own anything now that you're almost 60 years old? Huh. You got to bring something to the table, baby. You got to have a dowry. Daddy better have some money or somebody better have some money. I'm not the only one. I'm through bringing everything to the table. That happened when I was young and foolish, but that's over with. And you laugh. Y'all are laughing, huh? Hey, it's the truth. You know, we might as well be practical about it. You know, the kingdom of God is not impractical. You know, it's a very practical thing. Uh, let me get off of that. Some people say you're stepping on somebody's toes. Well, you know, sometimes we need to get uh, awakened. You know, people get in this cycle of, of, of poor money habits, and they won't change their money habits. You know, I, 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 you've got to make some changes. What's the, what's the definition of insanity? You know what it is. I don't have to say it. We're looking for mercy. We deal with people according to mercy. And I gave you that example of how God blessed me so that you would understand that having mercy brings mercy. And I'll tell you something else, too. It wasn't, and I told you on this, it wasn't but a couple of months ago, I got another letter in the mail from Vanguard. And I've been throwing them in the trash. I said, they must be soliciting some business. That's, that's what they want me to invest some money in. They did a good job for me. But you know what? I opened up that thing. I got another $4,000 in that thing that I didn't know nothing about. Man, that's not chunk change. That just shows you how God just keeps blessing. You know? I was shocked. 
I was really, I was really shocked. I was happy, but I was very, very shocked. God just keeps pouring out his blessing. When you, when you, when you, when you minister to the poor, when you give to the poor, the Bible says you lend to the Lord. Amen. Now he charges 20% interest. Did you know that? God charges 20% interest. If you don't pay your tithes, you hold that back or spend it on something else, then according to the Levitical law, you owe God 20%. So if he charges me 20%, then I can expect him to pay me or maybe even more. Amen? Praise God. God's good. Okay. Verse number 14. What does it profit, my brother, though a man say, I have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Listen to this. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Okay, so if we're going to demonstrate our faith, if we're going to add works to our faith, and I like all three examples of this, when he talks about it later on, some, uh, next week they'll cover that. But you know, here it's absolute necessity. These are people that have needs. Okay? Just, just a demonstration of your faith to reach out and give somebody something. It's going to cost you something that's going to be a sacrifice to you. And you minister to that person as a demonstration that you believe God. That God can give you back more than what you're ministering to that person. And you're demonstrating God's love and his kingdom. When people really have a need. When they come to you and they don't have anything to eat. How dare you send them away hungry? Or if they need a coat, they got a Goodwill right down here that you could go buy them a jacket or a windbreaker or help take care of them. Now this is talking about a bona fide need in the church. You can't just speak over somebody and bless them with your words and it make any change in their life. You know, and I like the example that, that he gave concerning Abraham. You know, Abraham obeyed God. He heard the voice of God. You don't need to hear the voice of God when it comes to somebody that is in desperate need, that doesn't have shoes. God doesn't have to speak to you about that. You can give that person enough money to feed them. I love, I love it. I'll, I'll be riding around with Joey down there. I'm almost out of time. I'll be riding around with Joey down there in Lafayette, and he'll see some bum on the side of the road. Or somebody with a, whole, a sign saying veteran, you know, need your help, you know, homeless, I'm hungry, uh, work for food. So my son Joey will swing in there, take out a $100 bill and give it to him and say, God bless you. The Lord loves you. And I've seen those people gasp. You know what I'm saying? God bless you, you know. And God gives my son more business than he knows what to do with it. He has respect to the poor. He doesn't look down on you know, just just simple. It doesn't, it, it doesn't take much to impress God. You know what I'm saying? He's impressed when you step out in love, when you step out in mercy, Amen. when you reach out to those that he loves and cares about. You know, Abraham heard the voice of God, and he was, he was willing to sacrifice his own son. That was an act of faith also, but he heard the voice of God to do it. That was a supernatural gift that God had gave to Abraham and he required it at his hand so that it wouldn't become an idol in his life. Because we can actually take the gifts of God. You can do that with money. You can do that with success. God can bless you and, and lift you up out of poverty and, 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 and put you on a high place and you can actually make an idol out of it and begin to worship that thing that become a curse to you. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go any further on that. But I just want you to, when you see somebody that's down, when you see somebody that's out, when you see somebody that's poor, when you have an opportunity to reach out and be merciful and look at them through God's eyes and how valuable they really are. Because, you know, we're going to be shocked one day when we get to heaven and the poorest of the people have the biggest place to live and the biggest mansion because they've been faithful and they love God. And they're rich in faith. Praise God. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. The Holy Spirit is here and His power is real. Anything can happen and it probably will. Something very good. Something good is going on.
doesn't think they're worthy of revival, that doesn't think they're worthy of being closer to God. And I just want you to know that none of us are worthy of being closer to God. But that doesn't stop Him from wanting us to be closer to Him. That doesn't stop Him from loving us. It doesn't stop Him from calling to us. So just lay down your burdens. Lay down your chains. Lay down your hardships. Lay down those mountains in front of Him because He loves you. And He wants you. And He wants to give you that relationship that you long for.
just yielding to him to change. I don't know about you, but I'm not where I, God needs me to be because I'm, I'm still on the progress of moving forward where God wants me to be. I've got a ways to go. I don't know about you in this house, but I believe most of us have a ways to go. And you can trust God this morning, no matter what's going on in your life. As, as Christina said, you may feel like I'm not qualified because I'm not, I've sinned in my life, I've failed in my life, I've messed up in my life. I want you to know that all God uses is messed up failures. God doesn't use all of us perfect people. Come on. They're, they're already disqualified because they think they're so good that they're better than God. But I want you to know, all of us in this room know that God needs to take this flawed vessel. Come on, anybody in the house? <laughs> Come on. God needs to take this flawed vessel and let his glory be seen. I don't know. I just want us to sing that, the other one that we were singing for a moment. When you move, when you speak, that part. And then after that, when you go in the spirit of the living God again. But as you stand there, present yourself to the Lord right now. Present yourself to the Lord. Say, here I am, God. When you do what only you can do, change is me. God, I'm ready for change in my life this morning. Just sing these words. Sing it unto the Lord. Sing it unto Jesus. Talking about him. To the Holy Spirit.
But I've just got to sing it so some of you singers can back me up. It says,
Christina and her spirit that she longs to, you know, come on, yeah. Yeah, Christina's got that heart that says, come on, everybody, let's worship God. He's worthy, amen, hallelujah. And, of course, Rebecca, God's using her and all these guys up here, even these old folks like us. <laughs> God still qualifies us and uses us all. Thank the Lord. It's so good to have all of you in the house of love, yeah. And of course, our guitar pickers. We got some great guitar pickers up here. Yeah. Brother Donald's been with us so long. He is. I don't know. Ron's been around a long time. Anyway, you can see that white hair up there. Don't y'all like that steel? Come on, we yeah. give an honor to him. I love the steel. We got a song we're gonna sing one of these days, and he's gonna be featured, and it's beautiful. Vaughn, thank you for being on that bass. Yeah. Do y'all hear the bass? Y'all can't hear it. Sister Lori on the drums over there, and of course, Nathan on the guitar over there. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God has blessed us. God has blessed us. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. All the singers, all the musicians, we just appreciate them from the bottom of our heart. It's good to have all of you here this morning in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you this morning because you're here. You're here among us. You said you were. Lord, you said in your word that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are there in the midst of them. And I thank you, oh God. I thank you for the work you're doing right now, Lord. As each of these respond by reaching out right now, God. Lord, each of them has said, here, lay hands on me. I'm one of those candidates for the provision of the cross where you bore in your body the suffering and the sickness so we don't have to. So, Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, total healing across this auditorium. We speak health and healing in every one of the situations where every hand is raised, oh God. And, Lord, I pray for, the, for Brandy and for Debbie, Lord, in the hospital this morning. I ask you to intervene in a mighty way and minister by the power of your Holy Spirit to them. God, by the power of God, go into that place and minister your perfect plan, your will, and your hand upon it, I pray, oh God. Lord, there are others I know that, that we may have not thought of their names, but you know them, each one, parts of this body, people that belong here. Lord, I pray for healing to flow to them. I pray for Jerry and Young today, Lord, as they go through the process of the wedding and travel home, that you'll keep your hand upon them. Lord, we do lift up Ethan and Nicole and believe you, Lord, in a mighty way to bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, and let this, let, let this wedding be a step in that direction, Father. Lord, we're believing you today for a great hand of God upon these situations. You are the one who is our healer. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah. You're going to be standing on the word because the word is the last thing that's going to be standing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for being here again. We just, hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be able to go to church? Amen. Never take that for granted. Never take it for granted. We're blessed in America to have the freedom of worship that we have in this great country. We really are blessed. So thank God for that. Continue to pray for our country, pray for our state. Pray for God to intervene and send a great revival. Amen. All right. Well, as we're getting ready to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Thank God for his blessings upon our lives. He's the one who enables us to get wealth, and we just celebrate that. You know, if it wasn't for God, we could be laying in a hospital bed instead of sitting here in church. I'm thankful that he's the one who enables us to get wealth, and thank you for those of you who are committed faithfully to minister to Oasis of Love by supporting this work. We appreciate from the bottom of our hearts, and please know that we pray earnestly for blessings to come back to you over and abundantly. Thank you again. God bless you. And while you're uh, getting your tithe and offerings ready and bringing them down, we're going to ask Brother um, Brother, Brother Roger, Roger, that's his name, Roger, to come and bless us with the song this morning. God bless you. Thank you all.
shakes the earth, it shakes the heavens. The hope of every heart, the Savior of the world, Jesus. Jesus.
uh, our pastor years ago, he would say we, and he meant the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and myself, you know, we, three of us. And, and then, of course, whoever else was involved family-wise. But I want you to share what you're doing. And like I said, about five minutes, and, and then we're going to give people a chance to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I was not sure what he was going to say or ask me to do. God put it in my heart because COVID has affected a lot of people in a way that we don't understand. See, in America, we have... You know, people who are generous, who give, and also government helped during COVID times. But let me give you a scenario, but I don't want you to think that I'm sharing this to play on your emotions, okay? Please understand, that's not the intention of it. Uh, I was sleeping one day, and I got a call in the middle of the night, about one o'clock. Most of the times, I, I get calls in the middle of the night because in Africa, Middle East, and India, Nepal, that's their daytime. A pastor called me and said, can you help? I said, what do you need? He said, a 30-year-old mother had a precondition of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, mild uh, breathing issue, but she got COVID. She was doing okay, and all of a sudden, in two days, she went into critical condition that she needs to be put in ICU. But right at that moment, the doctor said, you need to pay $2,000 in advance. You gotta understand, we don't understand in America. We have 911, you call, you get an ambulance, you go into emergency care, you go to hospital, and then the insurance will cover. No, there, you got to pay the money up friend even for the first day to be admitted to the hospital and they didn't have at that moment money. So they called and said, can you help us? Can I say, can I pray for you? <laughs> God bless you. God will. So I said, God, what do you want me? God said, you have a credit card. So I called people and I had to come up with the money to get her into the hospital and she was in the hospital for four days and she came out, now she was healed. That's one. Con one situation I can tell you. There are people who don't have the money. I don't know if you really can fathom this. They don't have the money to buy vitamin C. Can you, can you get this? You're like, what, what are you talking? Vitamin C? We got so many kinds. They, did, they don't have the money to buy vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc for those who are affected with COVID. So what we did is, we wired some money to a local pastor, and he bought it in huge quantities, they put it in a package, they went to every house which had COVID infected, and gave them the vitamins they need. In, in Nepal, we have given, and we are continuing to give, we have already done for 130 families. Who, are, who have lost a loved one in their house. I'm talking about fathers, mothers. I'm talking about children who are dead and they could not bury them. Can you imagine having a loved one dying is one thing. Second, because of COVID, they could not go and they would, they would even let them do a video funeral service for them to watch. So they dug a hole and they but so they're giving one month of groceries just to give them peace of mind. There are about 150 plus pastors are dead. These families don't know what to do. So in, in India, we're doing, we did for 30 pastors and their families, one month of groceries. Not a grandiose idea of steaks and you know what I mean. We're not even talking about that. You know, I'm talking about the simplest, basic, fundamental, what do you call, uh, basic meal like a rice and a lentil soup and a bottle of oil that they can cook rice and put some lentils and eat that because no money is coming. So how much does it cost? It costs roughly about $50 per family a month to buy them 25 kgs of, uh, you know, that's about 15 pounds of rice. With another bag of lentils, rice, salt, tea bags, coffee. 
and fifty dollars per family we can basically provide the basic necessary thing i'm not talking about any other meat or nothing it's just basic just like like our potatoes and you know what i mean like simple they will boil the rice and so we're doing that in india so that's what i was showing pastor about that some of them don't have oxygen cylinders, money for money to buy oxygen cylinders. And I told you, in America, we have all these facilities and insurance to cover. Government is giving you shots. You know, everything the government is able to provide and, you know, institutions are able to provide. But there in Nepal and in India, people have to pay for every ventilator. They have to pay. To get oxygen, they have to pay. For a bed, they have to pay. So that's what we are trying to do. And this has been a very, very tremendous, tremendous uh, opportunity. And one of the, thank God it's not live, I can share it, you know. One of the pastors said this to me. This has been the most blessed thing for us to do. He said, we gave it to non-Christians. And they looked at it and said, why are you doing it to us? In that area, they persecute Christians. But the churches are able to give to families who are non-Christians and their eyes are open to the love of God. Praise God. Praise God. So this is what pretty much you can be part of it. You know, you can provide for families, you know, health and medical bills and pastors, burial expenses. Do you know an ambulance would cost to go from your home to find an ICU bed? It cost them roughly about, if I can say, $500. You can say just $500? That $500 is probably two months' salary for an average Indian. Right. Now, I'll tell you one story that you'll understand. A pastor who's got about four or five churches, not just simple, ordinary church, he's got a huge church of 300 members, 400 members, five different churches. He got infected with COVID and he's out of. Chennai or Madras, the city, and he went on a, went, went, they took an ambulance looking for an hospital to find. He traveled for 25 hours going from town to town, traveling in an ambulance to find an hospital that would allow him to be admitted. And he died after five days because he never could find oxygen cylinder. So I was really dealing with my own heart. You know why? I'm living a blessed life. You can say $50? I spend $50 on a meal with four people. Take for example Coke. <laughs> we, we just drink soda. So there's so, so many things happening all around the world in different countries. So this is what God allowed us as a ministry to be part of. You know, my job is to, I don't try to put it on Facebook. You know, I hate because a lot of people, and I don't want to be like a fundraising. I said, God, I will do what I have the capacity to do. So a lot of people, God touched many different people. They came up with so many help. And we are able to send money to different nations. And I work with the local churches and I make sure that I get to receive the pictures, you know, because I want to make sure that we are accountable for what God gives to us. So thank you for this opportunity. And I want to take this time really to thank Pastor, Pastor's, uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor's wife and the, uh, the beautiful house of God, the family of God for helping me and helping the nations in this time of need. This morning, Roger spoke of a testimony. And I will finish with this testimony that goes in line with what is this. When I was in leadership of a church, we were in debt, huge debt. And one day God put it in my heart and said, would you help the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans? And I said, I'm already doing it. I'm giving more than the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm already giving here. I'm already giving there. I'm good. But God said, I'm showing you a key for what you've been praying. You said you wanted to be debt free and he, I'm not putting it, I'm not saying this as a formula, I'm just saying what God told me. He said, this is the key for you. If you will do this, I will open up the windows of heaven. So I stepped out and I put a call saying, I want to help build this orphanage. And we did it with three people. And you will not believe it through, I won't tell you how it, what happened, but through a means, something happened somehow, we became debt free, everything paid for, 
But the seed was the building that I offered to build for the orphanage. So I want to tell you something. I've seen this work in my life time and again and again and again and again. When I set aside, don't give out of your abundance only. Even give out of necessity and give out of in your midst of lack. Why God said take care of the poor and the needy and the downtrodden. And then you will see the windows of heaven open over you. Pour down like rain the blessing of God. Not just in your finances. He will bless your family and your long life. If you go to Psalms 40 it says if you take care of the poor. You will be health and healing and long life. Your generations will be blessed. I'm telling you there is such a heart of God in this when we sow into God's hand to take care of the poor and needy. So I appreciate you. Thank you for already what you guys have been doing. And we have been doing so much because we have partnered together, worked together. We are all working as a team. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. We will receive an offering and you give respond to that if you want to. And if you don't, then it's your business, okay? And if you do, then it'll be God's business, okay? How many of you believe God blesses you for giving? Okay. Amen. I believe with all my heart. And, uh, uh, you know, open your hand wide to the poor, you know, the Lord said. And, uh, and, and please know that that's not just everybody that sits at a street corner with a little sign with a sad looking face, you know, and tell you you're hungry, need money, and all that kind of stuff. The sons of God are led by the what? Spirit of God. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So everybody that you see out there saying they've got a need or saying they're hungry or not, you know, some of them are, some of them are not, some of them found it's a good way to make money. And so you're going to have beggars everywhere. But if God tells you to give and, and, and leads you to give, then give. But if you're giving out feeling sorry for them or that you've got an air-conditioned car and they're sitting out in the heat and that's why you're giving, well, that's not the Spirit of God necessarily leading you to give. But if you want to give, that's your business. If you've got plenty and you just throw it out, whether they buy drugs or, or cigarettes or whatever they buy or, or something else, well, then it's your business because we don't know what they're doing. We're not judging them. But I prayed a long time ago, uh, uh, was praying about the time uh, Brother Roger, I imagine, might be the part of the reason Brother John came to our church. And when he came, I said, Lord, lead, lead us to people, lead people across our path and our path across their path that are really doing something for God. Francis remembers this. He's not in their head. And uh, John was one of the ones that, that came, and there were some other people that we, we knew, and we knew what they stood for, and we knew that you could trust their ministry, and that they were really real. And then God led us to Brother John, and what a tremendous blessing I believe you're going to see someday to, to share just a little bit Amen. of the rewards Amen. because of giving to Brother John's ministry and the things that he's involved with. So we love you, Brother John, and appreciate you and trust you. And, um, and I want you to know that the Lord will bless you that give Amen. and you that have given. And let me just, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't get into all this again today, but if you would, uh, in the scripture, uh, if you would, I'll put up 2 Samuel 24 and 24. It's so funny that some of the things Brother Peter said, it's not funny, it's the Holy Spirit. Because this was a passage that was burning on my heart just a little bit. I could not get away from it, so I had to turn in my Bible uh, to, to pull this out. And I think that, that I will uh, read uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that, but maybe not. But anyway, the king, and this was talking about King David said to uh, Aruna, or however you say that, Nay, because, and look, let me tell you the story prior to this, just a minute. He, he was wanting to buy a threshing floor so he could offer up sacrifices to the Lord that the Lord would stay the plague that was on Israel and that the people would be healed of that plague. And, you know, I believe that there's probably a whole lot of folks that have offered up a lot of uh, offerings unto the Lord not just the monetary offering, but different offerings of prayer and interceding and fasting and everything for the COVID that was in our land 
that we've been faced with. And not only here, I believe there's people all over the world been doing the same thing, but the psalmist David said, uh, whenever the, uh, this guy here said, oh, yeah, no, king, you can have the floor, you can have the fresh floor, you can have the place, you can have the building, you can have the wood, well, I'll even give you the wood for sacrifice, I'll even give you the animals for the sacrificial um, uh, uh, sacrifice that you're going to offer to the Lord. And listen, go ahead and put the scripture up. Here's what David said. This was just kind of burning, burning in my heart. And the king, the king said to him, he said, Nay, no, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer any burnt offerings unto the Lord, my God, of that which doth not cost me nothing. And I want that to stick in your heart just a minute. He said, I'm not going to offer anything to the Lord that does not cost me nothing. I want it to cost me something. And he said, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And I looked at that just a little bit. I thought, well, I wonder how much that is. That was, I think, at least one ratio said that was about $16,000 for that old pile of, uh, that old rundown building there. Uh, just floor for, for King David to offer up for sacrifice unto the Lord in prayer, beseeching the Lord that he would heal uh, the land, stay the land of the plague that they were having. And But many, many times I thought, you know, uh, we, we give, and Brother, brother uh, uh, Peter hit on this just a little bit, but we, you know, we give sometimes, and, 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 and we think, you know, he mentioned $50. Uh, I hope some of you forget the $50 mark, and I hope some of you give a whole lot more liberal than that. I hope you give something this morning to where it costs you something. You know, let me just, let me just go, you know, how many of y'all probably blow $50 this week? How many of you be honest and raise a hand and say, I probably blow $50 this week? Now, some of you, please know, uh, don't raise your hand from this point forward. Who blowed 100? Who blowed 150? Who blowed 175? Who blowed 200? Who blowed 300? Come on, who will make it 400? Now, I just talked to a guy that said, in fact, when I said 400 and I stopped there, uh, I just talked to somebody that said he bought $400 worth of fishing lures. And he just bought $400 worth of fishing lures. And he had them all out like a little boy with his uh, toy cars. What do you call those little mini? The hot rods, okay, or whatever you call them. Hot wheels. Hot wheels, okay. I know Gary for a while, every time he seen one, he'd blow money on one of them little hot wheels so he could give it to his little hot grandson. And, uh, and I understand he loves his grandson. But here this guy was looking at it like a little hot wheel. He had his box out there and he's looking at all the fish baits that he bought. And, all, and, he, 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 and he was kind of bragging about it. Well, he really wasn't bragging about it. He said, man, I bought this ball $400 for it. He was talking about losing some money on something. And he said, and the guy said, what's wrong with you? You didn't even worry about losing that money. He said, man, I just bought $400 of fish baits. He ain't worried about it. And you know, it's amazing what we will spend money on when we won't spend it. And you know, we don't even think about that cost of us nothing, do we? And I don't know why that I started off hitting on this. is not what I intended on this morning, really. I mean, I intended on receiving an offering at the end here for just a moment. But uh, I mean, in a little bit here for, for this reason. Because I believe it's a good reason. I believe God's going to bless us as a church, but he's going to bless you as an individual when you respond to it. And I honestly believe, you know, um, when, we, when we give our tithe, I believe when we give our tithe, if we don't get past that just a little bit sometime, and please don't take offense to me right now, I, with all my heart, I want you blessed. How, how many of y'all like to be blessed? And, and if, you know, if we just chance with God and go through our life of just doing what we got to do or what we think's demanded of us, and we don't go a little bit extra and do something that costs us, don't you think it cost the Lord whenever he bought all of us when he went to the cross of Calvary? Don't you think it cost him a little bit of prayer? Don't you think it cost him a lot of prayer? Don't you think it cost him a lot of pain and a lot of suffering? Don't you know he could have done other things, you know, and he could have called for help and, and not went that route, but... He gave his life so you and I could have life, so it cost him something. Right. You know, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't even believe, you know, this is Father's Day. Let me, let me just go ahead and say this. Uh, I, I did see, I looked on the, 
the camera a little early as people was coming in for morning worship. And I could see, uh, uh, all I could see on the screen there, Sam, was just a bald-headed man with a green checkered shirt on. Look, look, look down at the shirt right now and see who I'm talking about. And he was kind of sitting there toward the center of the deal. And I mean, I saw kids all around him, a little kid, and I saw a grin. He just looked like his mouth was this wide. He just smiled from ear to ear. And I zeroed in a little bit on that camera. Like, oh, that's Brother Mark. It must be the Caleb. And, and uh, of course, his wife all bought, brought all these beautiful children. They come to honor him today on Father's Day, to be with him on Father's Day. And that's what it was. And, and he's still smiling. He really is. And I got to look at him one on one knee and one on another knee. You know, one on one leg, one on another leg, and another one up there, it looked like. And, and, all. and isn't it a joy whenever we, we, we have our family and our children? Amen. And you know, it, it, let me just go ahead and say this. It even costs to be a good father. You know, it costs our Heavenly Father. You know, the Bible talks about he, he uh, that's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, he, he felt forsaken. The, the Father didn't feel him then when he was dying on the cross of Calvary. But, you know, there's a... Uh, and, and, and the Lord, somebody said that God the Father had to turn the other way. He couldn't stand to look on, on it when it was going on on Calvary. And, and I don't know. Nobody really knows for sure. There's some scripture that say a few things about it. But, you know, it even costs. Let me just go ahead and say this to us. It even costs to be a, a good father. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? It costs. It costs money. Come on. It costs time. It goes, and, and you know, I, I was reflecting back just a little bit, and and uh, I, you know, I thought of my, my dad. You know, I had, he, he's gone now, he already promoted the glory. But, you know, I, I sat there and even got to think about it just a little bit and got to weeping some, you know. Not, not because I was quote unquote missing him, but I was grateful to God, you know. I'm, I'm sort of already past that. I realize he's been gone long enough that I, that I don't still have that same sorrow that I had right there when it was fresh when my dad first was promoted to glory. And some of y'all understand what I'm talking about. My mom, even longer than that. But since this is Father's Day, uh, I, I was thinking about my dad. And you know, I had a godly dad. That's one thing I can say that I, I thank the Lord for the example in front of me and the inheritance that I have because of him, because, you know, he, I, I don't know how many of you had a dad like I had, but my dad never, let me say when we were young, my dad wasn't one of these kind of dads that, that took me fishing, okay? My dad never taught me to fish. My dad never taught me to hunt. He, my dad allowed me to go with some of the, his son-in-laws and, and, uh, some of my friends, after I got older, then I had permission. And one, one thing, let me just stop and regress here just a minute and say something. One, and most of the children are gone now. We got a few that probably don't understand that in here now and don't understand a thing that I'm saying, even if they could understand all the English vocabulary right now, they wouldn't understand it really. And, and then we've got a few that may be, oh, we've got a few children that are still here. I'll say children if they're under 20. How's that? Is that okay? Would, how many of y'all like to be a child again? Be under 20 again, okay? If you know what you know now. You know, now you wouldn't want to go back there and not know. But, you know, that, daddy never, daddy never, daddy played with us a little bit, just sometimes, but daddy never had much time to play. But one thing Daddy did do, you know, Daddy taught me how to fire a torch up. I kind of wished I'd never learned that. <laughs> Daddy also taught me, said, son, don't say can't because can't never could do nothing. How many of y'all have about the same Daddy? Okay, I know Roger did. Roger raised his hand. Melvin would, mm, anyway, Melvin was, would be tough about working, man. I can tell you that right now. But my daddy taught me some good worth ethics. How many of you can say the same thing? You know, my Father's Day. My daddy taught me not to be lazy. My daddy taught me to work. My daddy taught me to, 
that, that you could do anything with tools, if you had tools, regardless of you know, whatever kind of tools are. If you got a hammer and a saw, you can build a house. Come on, or build a porch or add on your house. If you've got a cutting torch and a welding machine, you can build, fabricate anything out of, out of metal if you wanted to. And these kind of things, I appreciate, I value those things. And my daddy taught me how to change oil in the car. My daddy taught me how to uh, tighten a chain on a bicycle. My daddy taught me how to take an inner tube out of a, a tire that was flat and fix it. My, my daddy taught me, and, and, and you know, there's some kids don't even know how to tighten a chain on a bicycle. You know why? Because mama don't know how to do that. Now, I know, raise your hand, mama, if I offended you right then. If you're a mama that knows how to do it, raise your hand. I understand some of you were tomboys, and some of y'all hung around daddy, but daddy taught you how to do it. I, I dare say your mother didn't teach you how to tighten a chain on a bicycle. Okay, some kids don't even know how to get a lawnmower blade off safely on an old lawnmower that, uh, uh, you know, that you jerk the rope on the starter, uh, I mean, on the, on the engine to crank it, and it's got a blade under four wheels, and you've got to push it. I'm not talking about a self-propel more. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about a zero turn. Man, if I'd had a zero turn, I'd been a rich man right now. I'd still be in the yard service if they had a zero turn back when I was in the 60s. How many of y'all understand what I'm talking about? Some of y'all don't have a clue. I seen one of a few, about 10 people with a head bobbing and, and like that. But man, I'm talking about the old lawnmowers. And the kids don't know how to be safe with it, you know, or how to even do it. Don't know which way the bolt turns on the blade. You know, you get the bolt. I'm glad my daddy taught me those kind of things. Now, if your daddy didn't teach you those kind of things, then you're still okay. If your daddy taught you how to find God, and if your daddy taught you how to love mom, right. you know, that's one thing. How many of y'all can say that you knew? Come on. Yeah. How many of y'all can say that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your dad did love your mother? Okay? And I know some of you may not could raise your hand. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But I never saw my dad ever come into the house without hugging and kissing mom and say, I love you. I never saw daddy leave the house without hugging and kissing mom and saying, I love you, baby, and you better have supper built when I come home. Now, he didn't say that because you know why? Daddy knew that mama would have supper ready, and mama, daddy knew that mama would have the house clean. <coughs> and, and, uh, uh, yeah, oh me, yeah, oh me. It's like, come on, pass it on back, pass it on back, pass me by, Lord, pass me by without me, Lord. Daddy knew that she'd have the clothes washed, even the whole time he waited. And look, I came up on the, I had to fill the tubs up with water, come on. Francis says, thank the Lord it's not that way anymore. Now we got an automatic washer. And now we got a, a, a dryer that will let you know, I did a bug you crazy, that would let you know the clothes are dry and hurry up, come get them out. And I've always said one of these days, these modern inventions that we got now, the way things are going with all the technology we got, one of these days you're going to hear your dryer instead of going, it lets you know and it'll turn them some more, about five minutes later, anybody got some dryers like that or a dryer like that? It lets you know, hey, it's fixing to cut off, hey, you better get up off of your, uh, uh, your, uh, <laughs> Anyway, your backside and get up here and get these things because if you keep listening to this thing go burn and you keep sitting there watching TV and cat napping and doing what you want to do, then you know that your clothes are going to be all wrinkled up whenever that thing cools down. While it's warm, you get it out, you can get your clothes up. And if you're not too lazy, how many of you know if you're not too lazy, most of your clothes you wouldn't even have to touch if you get them out and hang them up right then after they get dry. Am I telling the truth? Come on now, pants or whatever. Well, now one of these days they're going to have one that goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. that means get out of the way, don't stand up, don't get in the way, the clothes are coming out of the dryer, they're going to jump on the hook, a hanger, and they're going to run to the closet and hang themselves up, and they're going to tuck everything, they're going to fold the collar just right and button the top button, and they're going to space them out three inches apart, that's how you want to do it. How many of y'all be first in line to buy a dryer like that if you get one like, well, hang on, he's coming, I prophesy. And if Jesus tears long enough, we'll probably have something like that. We've already got robots. Come on, that are, that are vacuum the floor. Mama used to do it like this. Come on. Amen. 
and, and all. But you know, Daddy never worried about the house being clean. He never worried about the meals being cooked. He never worried about none of that. He never worried about Mama running off and leaving the kids and they getting in trouble, burning the house down. But Daddy always knew that my dad loved my mother. And, and you know, Francis has said this many times, a lot of people don't know anything about the love of the Heavenly Father because they, you know, your kids, you're one of the biggest instruments in God's hands right now to show the love of God and to, to teach those kids that, hey, God loves them because of your love for them and your dedication to them and you being a father, you know, home. You know, there's confusion in a lot of places now when they say Father's Day because some people don't even know who their daddy is. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I want you to know it's important if you're a father and you find, you know, anybody can have kids, but it takes a real man to come on to be a father. Right. Anybody can give birth to children, but it takes a real uh, person, a real mama to be a mama. Uh, to be a mother to those children that we birthed into this world. Amen? And let me just go ahead and say, guys, it may be tough, and you may want to leave, and there may be some things not right, but talk about some things and pray and believe God and trust God and let God work some things out so those kids won't have to wonder where daddy's at. Because it's important for, for children to have a father. Amen. And it's very important. And, and I can remember the things that my dad instilled in me as a child. And I'm thankful he did that. I mean, I used to even build motors. And I don't want to build motors no more. I'm going to leave that to Perry, okay? I'll leave that to Perry. Leave that to other people. But, but I'm, I'm, and I'm thankful for guys that know how to do some things. And when I look at that, I think, yeah, I believe you had big influence of even an earthly father here pouring into you so you would know how to do some things. But I'm thankful that. But you know, more than all that, I'm so thankful that my dad didn't send me to church, but my dad carried me to church. And I was raised in the fashion to where, you know, and, and that it was not even a question over going to church. I don't care what kind of company we had there, if I hadn't seen them for years, I knew better than to go in there and ask mom and daddy could I stay home to play with my cousins until they got back home from church? I knew better. I'm not saying Daddy would have knocked me across the floor. He, he wouldn't have. He would have just said, no, sir, young man, you're going to church. And you're going to be quiet in church. <laughs> you, how many of y'all had the same Daddy? And also my Daddy could do this. I knew Daddy snap. Anybody have the same daddy? Yeah. Boy, daddy snapped that finger. If I, it's so funny. My daddy must have had eyes in the back of his head. Or either him and the preacher had something going on, and maybe the preacher would point back there, and then daddy, he'd look at my daddy and do like that, and then daddy knew it was me probably. Sitting there maybe talking or doing something in church. But you know, that was when I was little. It didn't take long that I finally give my life to Lord Jesus Christ on my own. And I couldn't wait because I knew my daddy loved the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I would, I would see my daddy sitting on an altar, crying and praying, speaking in tongues, and one hand raised in the air like this, and the other one on the head of somebody that he was praying with at that altar. Now, years ago, I'd see him kneeling doing the same thing. But as he got on up in the 80s, he'd be sitting on an altar and sitting there praying. He'd be the last one to leave. If anybody want to talk to God, Daddy would stay there with them just as long as they want to talk to God. And I thank God for that inheritance. How about you? You know, I, I, I just praise the Lord for something. And so, Daddy, I want to encourage you. Look, it's going to cost you something. You know, David said, I'm not going to give the Lord anything that's not going to cost me. And, 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 and so it's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some effort. It's going to cost you some dedication. I know we've got some family. We've got some in our church. If daddy don't come to church, the whole family will stay home. And, and you, know, what, you know, I don't think nothing to make daddy any prouder than if daddy couldn't go, if daddy was sick, that the family would go ahead and go to church. 
Because how many of you know, most of the time, they're not all ganged around his bed to ask him, what can they do? Put the cold back on his head, and can I go get you something to eat, or can I fix you something, or are your legs hurt, can I rub your leg? They're not around there, they're just goofing off, doing things, riding this, riding that, going here, going there. But when the dad sometimes don't come to church, the whole family won't come to church. Isn't it kind of, don't you know that dad has a big influence in a lot of families, and can have an influence in families? So it's important that you do. And then when I when I when I mention this about not giving God something that don't cost me, David said, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna give God anything that don't cost me something. I honestly believe when the scripture even said about here I go again about giving. When will a man rob God? And he said, Well, when we robbed you, he said, You brought me in tithe and offering. I honestly believe when you give God a tithe, it's not yours anyway, it's his. It's a holy thing. The Word of God says it belongs to him. And I promise you, if you'll start and learn to give God his tenth, which is holy, and belongs to the Lord. How many of y'all know the Word of God says that? It's holy and belongs to the Lord. It's his. That's what he said. If we'll give God that, but bring that. And some people say, well, you don't pay it, you bring it. Well, Jesus said these, he talked to the ones that paid their tithes. He said, I know you paid your tithe. But he said, these things you ought to have done and not omitted the weightier matters of the law. He said, you ought to have paid your tithe. That's what Jesus said. And you said, so was that? That's Matthew 23 and 23. If you don't believe me, you can look and see. And he said, that's what Jesus said. And he said, these things you ought not have done and not left the other undone. And then he said, love, judgment, and mercy, and all these things are the weightier matters of the law. And I honestly believe sometimes that we'll, we'll just kind of, even on that, we'll just give God time. Say, okay, right, here's this little 10%. Now I've got that off me. i got that deal paid. You feel a little bit relieved you give it. But if we run, if we, and without it being asked for, without any, anybody making a pull, now I'm not talking about like this morning, but if it was just without, if we just decide to make our tithe check out and then say, okay, God, I'm going to give you something that cost me something. How many of y'all have ever Felt something even on the inside telling that you telling you to write a check bigger than what you was going to write it. Raise your hand, please. Yeah. Yes, and how many of y'all have ever wrote that check bigger whenever God would lay that on you? And I know many of you have. And then God blessed you. Oh, yeah. it, it just, you could not believe how God would just open another window up there that Brother John talked about. You know, that's what he said. He said, prove me now. The only place in the Bible says prove me. If I not open you to win of heaven and pour you out blessings, there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I'll like verse 11, and I'll do something else for you. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Isn't it amazing? If, you, if you'll start giving God a little something that costs you, it may cost you time. It may cost you a little of your money. You may not can buy them $400 worth of fish and lures that you want to buy. You may not can buy that golf club or that golf cart. You may not can buy that motor scooter. You may, and by the way, I better shut up. I started to try to be funny again. I'm not really trying to be funny. I started to say, I've seen God before stretch legs, and I'm cutting up Michelle, where are you at? But I seen it when somebody needed to be healed and their back was messed up. I've held their feet before and seen God as people prayed and believed God to stretch that leg out that was short, and then people quit walking with a limp, and I've seen that happen numbers of times. God can do anything. And you know, I want you to know, you may be needing a miracle, and, and maybe maybe what you need to do is say, okay, God, God already laid something on your heart to do, and you hadn't done it yet. And I'm not just talking about giving money right now, but if it's money, then that too. But what I'm saying, maybe there's something God has really laid on you, you felt it on the inside to do, but you just kind of backburned it and didn't get the job done. You just didn't do it. Maybe it was an error in ministry or something else. I don't know. I can't say. But I want you to know, if you'll begin to take the attitude like Psalmist David said and say, I'm not going to give God anything if it don't cost me. I want it to cost me. You know, and sometimes that cost hurts a little bit. Come on. Sometimes you'd rather be somewhere else besides church. I, I, I understand. Sometimes there'd be a lot of things a whole lot more fun than taking time out uh, to, to uh, come to God's house. But, I mean, you're, you're not that way because you're here, and I praise God for that. And so I thank you for that. But I want you to know, you know, just, just, be, just be pondering, you know. 
and, and uh, about God, am I really, am I really, is this costing me anything, what I'm giving to you, my service, my time, my, my finances, or what it, is it costing me anything? I, and you know, King David, how many of you know and believe that King David was blessed above, I mean, that man was blessed, God blessed him. He also blessed him, one thing I think we've all needed, I know we've all needed it for. How many of you needed a bunch of mercy and grace? Woo, goodness. And God blessed King David with that. Amen. I mean, King David pulled some, did some things and all. But God blessed him with mercy and grace and goodness and blessings. But he blessed him with houses and riches and wealth and blessings of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, it's amazing what God can do. But uh, uh, one more time, how many of y'all are thankful? You can think back just a little bit of some things that your daddy instilled in you on this Father's Day. And give God praise for it. Give him thanks. If you would, uh, I'd like for you to just bow your head and close your eyes this moment. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. But I'm, I'm going to ask you, I believe some of you already prayed, made your mind up, you care of you come on. And, and I believe you've already... Uh, decided, maybe some of you already said that, hey, this is what you want to do to help feed the hungry. And we're going to do that through, brother. We're going to give this funds to uh, brother, uh, uh, Peter. brother Peter. Peters. Uh, I saw something else going on and I got a little distracted and want to be for safety. But brother Peters, we're going to entrust it to him because it'll be going through his ministry. Uh, that, is, that is legal and formed. And so uh, let's just obey God in that, if you would, and the Lord bless you. In fact, in here, just a, just, a, just a less than a minute, you can get up, and I've got a basket right here. If you already felt something, God speak to you, you can put that in. But what I, what I want to say right now is if you're here and you say, hey, Pastor, I'm, I'm really not serving the Lord right now or I'm a little out of fellowship, Maybe you, and, and it don't mean that, that you that you don't know the Lord, but I pretty much feel like all of you do that's here, but maybe you just say, I'm just out of fellowship, but I pray for me, I'd like to get back to fellowship. I'm not going to call your name, I'm not going to embarrass you, but would you slip that hand up, because she's playing the song I love so much, it says, just as I am, without one plea. You know, don't wait till you get good enough. Don't wait till you get things right. Don't wait till you climb the corporate ladder. Don't wait till you achieve certain goals right now, just as you are, without one plea. Come to the Lord and say, God, please help me now from this day forward. Come into my heart, my life, my soul in a powerful way. I want to have fellowship with you. You know, and God will bless you. And you know, the biggest... I'd rather have the inheritance that I've had from my dad on this Father's Day as I reflect back than if dad had left me a million dollars. You know, the money would be great, but the inheritance that I got, spiritually speaking, is far more valuable than money than silver or gold. So I'm thankful for that leadership. I'm thankful, thankful for that example. I want you to be the example in front of your children because this whole world that we're living in now is going down fast. But Jesus is going to take us up real fast here one of these days. It's going to happen. But right now we've got this life to live. And he said, occupy until it comes. So anybody here, you say, hey, look, pray for me, preacher. I, I, I want your prayers. And like I said, I'm not going to embarrass you. I want the church's prayers, okay? All right. Thank you, Lord. I come. I tell you what, you can stand if you would, and and if you didn't want to respond in this offering, you feel free. As Sister Carol plays something, if you want to stop and bend the knee and pray just a moment, you can. But if there's something you want to be a part of this, some of you that want to, and I see many, many people coming and responding, and we're going to just plead with the Lord. And I will say that he said, well, I don't have it now, but I'll have it in uh, uh, two weeks or whatever. If you'll let us know that, put it on a note. We can go ahead and put it in the hands where the ministry can go on and take care of a whole lot more people that are in need. Thank you all so much for responding, for coming. 
I, I knew you would. I just, I mean, I felt so strong to do this because I want our church to be blessed. God will bless you for giving. And that's not why we give, because we give to obey God. And if you'll do that from this day forward, just obey God whenever he speaks. It's amazing how he opened the windows of heaven. And I love you. Thank God for you. Appreciate you more than you'll know. So God bless you. Praise God.